Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Be Truth webinar. Thank you a lot for joining. Uh, my name is Yang. I am a Be Truth Online Events Manager, and I will be your moderator for today. And today we will talk about remote tech teams and about the way how we can manage them. And we have three beautiful speakers who have prepared presentations with their real life experience and best practices, and they will tell you how they manage these kind of tools already for a couple of years. And um, before welcoming the speakers, we need a couple of minutes to wait for other audience to join the event. So uh, I have prepared like this small introduction to uh, the audience. So uh, right now on the screen, you can see your video. And on the, on the right side, there is like this small YouTube live chat. I need you to use those slide chat because now we will have the questions. And uh, the first question is about the country. So can you please type there in the live chat where are you from? The name of the country or your city, uh, and I will read it out loud so we can, uh, you know, just like talk <laughs> a bit and uh, know who are here today with us. Okay, I don't see countries for now. I'm really waiting. Please be active. London, England. Hi, Abigail. Nice to see you. Ukraine, Spain. Welcome, Spain. Netherlands, Tunisia, Holland, Kenya, Germany, Switzerland. Oh, more, more, more. Give me more countries. <laughs> Very nice that we have like people from all over the Europe here. Thank you a lot for being active. More in Netherlands here. Perfect. Okay. So, okay. Even Nigeria. Oh, very nice. Uh, thank you for being active. I have the second question here already. So, uh, can you please um, tell me how many people are in your team who you have to manage? Please just type the number. And I will also read it out loud to the whole audience. Okay, wait and wait and wait. Uh huh, we have like those delays. So, I don't see numbers for now, but I'm almost sure that you are ready to type it. 25, Abigail, thank you. If you have no developers for now, you can type just zero. We know that you're getting ready. Seven, I see. Four, uh huh. Okay. 50, you're lean. It's a huge team. Oh my gosh. Okay, then you see. Perfect. Okay. Two, three, two, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, thank you a lot for your answers and for being here with us. I can see that more and more people are joining and that's mean that we can already jump from our intro part to like the event. Uh, and um, before I uh, wanna tell a couple of words about our agenda. So we have three speakers and after each speech, the speech will be 15 minutes. And after each speech, we will have five, five minutes for Q&A. Uh, so you can type your questions in the live chat in YouTube and I will read it out loud and our speakers will answer to your questions. And you actually have this unique possibility to talk to people who are working with the remote tech teams. So please be active and ask your questions. You already, if you have something, please prepare them and like use it during Q&A. And uh, one more point is uh, uh, some of, of the points in our speakers presentations might be overlapping and it will happen because all those people they will share their real life experience and you know if their suggestions and solutions are overlapping that's mean that it's actually the best practice and it's actually working so uh, i think that you have to write it down and definitely use it in your practice and check and i'm almost sure that it will work well yeah so uh, i'm done with the intro part and please welcome our speakers. Here you can see Yael Brooks, uh, she's CEO from Simaco. Also we have Oleg Danilenkov, uh, he is co-founder and CEO at Timico. And we have Tanya Bojchenko, she is Chief People Officer at Bitrip. And the first one, according to our agenda, is Yael. 
Ariel is a CEO and she has a team of developers who are actually working remotely. And uh, they are working in this format already for a couple of years. And uh, Ariel uh, is ready to share how they work and what is the best for them. So welcome, Ariel. Da -da -da. Thank you, Lesha. I'll just share my screen. Great. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining this afternoon. Really exciting to have people uh, from all over Europe and globally as well. Um, so my name is Yael Brooks and I'm the CTO of Steamico. And today I'm gonna be sharing some practical tips and ideas for managing remote tech teams. Um, but first, a little bit about me. So as I mentioned, I'm the CTO at Steamico. Um, Steamico provides smart automation and analytic solutions for utilities in emerging markets with a really big focus on Africa. Um, my background is in software engineering and data analytics, um, but where I've really found my sweet spot is combining my passions for tech and for really understanding people, finding what motivates them and how to get the best outcomes for the business, but also for them. So this is some of my team at Steamico. Um, this amazing group of faces that I see every day. And I manage the engineering data and product teams, and we're all based uh, over in the UK, Ukraine, and Georgia. And, you know, I've been leading teams at Steamico for five years. And five years ago, before the COVID pandemic, um, this picture looked very different. And I'm not just talking about the funny faces. So back then, we were all based in Manchester, all of us in the office every day. I'm sure this was the reality for a lot of you back then. For us, even hiring someone from London, which is a two hour train ride away, was a no go. We were scared they wouldn't be productive. We were scared we wouldn't be able to all get around a whiteboard and do brainstorming. Uh, they wouldn't be able to absorb the team culture that we worked so hard to create. But then the pandemic happened and we had no choice. We were sure we'd all be back working from the office really soon. But slowly, we actually got used to this new way of working and actually found that for our team, this made a lot more sense. More focused time with less distractions, no commute, and more flexibility, which not only allowed a better work-life balance, but also accommodated team members who were more productive at different times of the day. Fast forward a year, <clears throat> and we continue to see even more benefits to working remotely. The developer market went global. We were now able to get the best talent, not just in Manchester, but further afield. We decided this was our long-term way of working, and that was when we made our first few tech hires from the other side of the UK. This worked really well for us as a team and led us to last year bring on five new members of the tech team, working completely remotely from Ukraine and Georgia, including what you'd call a unicorn developer with experience in a really niche area that we probably wouldn't have found anywhere else. So when we talk about leadership and management, it's never an or. It's an and. They're complementary. Not one is not better than the other. It's situational. So different people in different situations require you to tap into different approaches. And in a lot of cases, you'll need both. When we're talking about remote working, we face a whole new set of challenges with regards to this balance. We need to be deliberate to think through not only what process can I implement or tool can I start to introduce, but also really focusing on the people. How can I ensure that they have that psychological safety, that trust, and that motivation to ensure that they can deliver to a high standard? It's a common misconception that remote working requires tighter management control due to the lack of physical presence and accessibility to those people. And that's why a lot of businesses have started going back into the office. But instead, what I believe is that to maintain a high-performing remote tech team, we should actually do the opposite. Ensure our remote tech teams feel really empowered to be productive and to deliver. So for me, there are three areas that need attention and intentional approach for empowering remote tech teams. Firstly, autonomy. So team members feel they have the power and trust to make decisions and take actions. Connection. Team members feel part of a supportive group and community. And engagement. Team members feel they are motivated and working towards a common goal. These aren't easy things to do in an in-person team, so how do we tackle the additional challenges that may come with remote working? Let's have a look. So this is a skeptical Steve, he's not so sure about remote working, 
Um, and with remote working, I hear this common worry a lot that you could be paying people to sit around and watch Netflix all day um, or work on the tech debt that you specifically decided not to tackle right now. So this drives this natural instinct in some managers to want to control more. But actually, as I've said, you know, if you work toward building that autonomy in your team, you'll find that your team will feel valued and trusted and therefore more personally motivated to deliver, which will increase productivity. So how do we practically do this? First, setting those boundaries. With my team, beyond our product development process, each team member has three very simple measurable objectives each quarter that contribute to us achieving the company-wide yearly strategic objectives. We set them together at the beginning of each quarter. This gives team members the tools to ask themselves, is what I'm working on or advocating for moving us in the right direction? Is it a business priority? Next, tracking progress. We want to do this in a way that's visible to everyone. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Every morning we pull up our JIRA board at Stand Up. The key here is to set the expectation that the responsibility for proactively updating the progress is the team members and that they are accountable not only toward their manager, but to the rest of the team in the business. This creates ownership and trust. For some people who've always been micromanaged, autonomy can feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable at first. For some people, this requires a gradual buildup of confidence. One way to do that is to normalize delegation and rotation of tasks. For example, we all have that one person in the team who's an expert in a certain area of our system. When there's an issue, they're the obvious choice to investigate it. By encouraging someone else in the team to look at it, you might create a short-term feeling of discomfort, but in the long term, they are practicing the skills to apply their knowledge to something new and therefore gaining that confidence in being autonomous. I actually asked one of our recent joiners what hints they got when they first joined us that we had this culture of autonomy, how they knew that that's how we operated. Um, and he actually said to me, when I joined and I observed, I saw people being encouraged to take risks. And maybe they would make mistakes, but no one was blamed for those mistakes. They were dealt with as a learning experience by the whole team. That gave me the confidence to go ahead and make those decisions within my work. So I see this as a, a cultural thing within the team. Um, so things like, you know, setting postmortems, encouraging people to try out things that, you know, theories that they might have, um, and that then gives that confidence. Another challenge that comes up with remote teams is establishing that connection between team members. When you're in person, you can physically get, you know, around that whiteboard and you feel that energy in the room. How do we create that same atmosphere within our remote tech team to ensure that they help each other and don't feel isolated? So when you're remote, you maybe don't get as many spontaneous opportunities to socialize with your team and build relationships. You know, everyone likes to talk about, you know, standing by the coffee or the water cooler. So what I recommend is to instead be deliberate about it and encourage that small talk at the beginning of the meeting. Schedule in a fun team building event. One thing that makes it easier to remember to do that is to just build that into your routine. For example, every morning at our standup, we do an icebreaker question. These can be silly, funny, serious, thought provoking. We then go around and give each team member the opportunity to answer that question. It gives us all really good energy first thing in the morning, and it reminds us that we're all in the same boat and our team is there to help us. Another thing I hear a lot is that it's a challenge for people in remote working uh, to onboard new team members, specifically around kind of overhearing the context or the conversations um, of people in the team. So how do you gain all that context when you can't overhear conversations? Something we really try to enforce at Steamaco is to avoid DMing on Slack, unless of course it's a personal matter. If you have a work-related question or thought, share it in a public channel. This way everyone can overhear or even join in. Someone who was not maybe the intended audience for the question might be able to answer your question faster than the person you were asking. Um, and we avoid information being passed along incorrectly. Of course, then people feel more connected to each other and less intimidated to reach out for help if there's that constant conversation going on. Finding opportunities to share learning is a great way to create connection in the tech team. Specifically, we do a tech talk every two weeks where someone will present something new that they've learned, maybe a side project or even just a random cool tech thing. Uh, we recently actually had an interesting one on the uh, funny uses of ChatGPT, which was quite fun. Um, and then you kind of build those connections and do something a little bit outside of the normal 
um, which really cultivates those relationships. And finally, a bit of a tongue twister, tackling tough tasks together. Create a culture of helping each other. If someone blocked on solving a turkey bug, suggest that someone jumps on a call in pairs with them. A big refactor everyone's dreading, turn it into a virtual team hackathon. Once you start to build that as routine, people will uh, crave that more and want to build those relationships and connect with people over those tough tasks. Fostering engagement. How can you motivate your team when it's just them and their laptop? Give them those reasons to feel engaged and not just when the morale is low. First, connect the team to their work's impact and often. I like to use my turn at standup. You know, if I join engineering standup, for example, I don't necessarily have any updates for the sprint, um, but I like to use that platform uh, as my chance to connect everyone in the team to what else is going on outside the sprint in the business on a daily basis. Which customers are we meeting with that are waiting for this specific feature? What positive feedback did I get yesterday on a call? How did the integration we completed help people get power for the first time in their lives in our specific case? This is tangible and goes beyond a catchy sentence about the, the company's vision or goals. The other side to this is sharing the team's work with the rest of the business. So at Steamico, we do a monthly company-wide all hands where each team shares what they've been working on. So our engineers get a chance to demo their latest work to the whole business. Uh, and that gives them a chance to really be proud of the work that they've completed and also get feedback on it. This also puts into perspective for the rest of the team, the rest of the business, uh, how much effort the tech team puts into their work. Next, constantly being on the lookout for opportunities where your team members' personal development interests can fall into planned work. If someone wants to get more experience with AWS, suggest they lead on the next infrastructure POC. This will reassure them that they are not only serving the company, but working on the things that matter to them. And that's definitely engaging and motivating. And finally, cultivate a culture of celebrating people. There's nothing like being recognized and it doesn't have to be a formal award ceremony. Set yourself a goal as a manager to recognize one person each week who has done something beyond your expectations. Make sure to call that person out either on Slack, in standup or, on, or in the retro. You'll find that it's contagious and others in the team will actually quite quickly start doing it themselves as well. With all of these approaches, one size does not fit all. I like to have this mental image of a slider. Sometimes you may have to pull the slider all the way to one side, maybe giving a, a try to something new, like giving more autonomy than you're comfortable with. And you might find that you went a little bit too far and have to kind of pull that back. But as long as you learn from that and continuously improve, uh, adjusting that slider back and forth, you'll be on your way to success. So thank you and very happy to answer any questions. Thank you a lot, Yael, for sharing the stories from your business and your teams. Uh, very nice to hear how it's actually working. And while I was preparing the question, we got a question in the chat. So first will be the chat question. Uh, Yulia May is asking, how often do you share your team's work with the rest of the business? Yeah, really good question. So formally, as I mentioned, we do a monthly all hands um, where the team get to um, kind of talk through the features that they developed or new work that they've uh, completed. Um, but in general, we try to do it as much as possible. So if there is something we've just released or something that the team's completed that we want to shout about, um, we do that quite often on Slack. Um, and everyone is really excited to see that because just like the tech team really like to see the impact that their work has, the rest of the business really like to see what's coming up in the tech. So it's it's a win-win. Yeah, good. Uh, and I have a question uh, from me. So are you happy about your decision as a CTO to go remotely? How Absolutely. do you feel about this? Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, there's definitely... Uh, some downsides, um, like, you know, just like we've spoken about, but I think overall, there are so many upsides, especially being able to, uh, as, as I mentioned before, get developers that we wouldn't have necessarily been able to get uh, if we were only looking in our local area, people having that flexibility um, to, you know, be able to work different hours or um, kind of start their day maybe a little bit later, 
um, because if they have other things in their lives going on, and we find that generally people are much less burnt out and a lot happier. Yeah, nice. Um, so would, would you suggest uh, other businesses to go with the remote tech team? Would you say like it's really good idea? Yes, absolutely. So I would definitely say uh, I would go for it myself. I would do it again. Um, but but I think that it's really important to do it intentionally and deliberately. So it's not going to be it's not going to work exactly the same as in an in person office, and you have to be aware of that um, and kind of work with your team in that way uh, to make it work. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I, I hope that uh, our audience is even more inspired right now after your answers. Um, one more question from the chat. So. Uh, Yulia is asking, do you have offline all hands meetings, maybe annually? Do you practice this? Sorry, I think I missed the beginning of the question. Yeah, so the question is, do you have offline all hands meetings? Uh, like an in-person where we get people? Uh, yeah, yeah, get... like same building. Yeah, so um, we still do um, a quarterly all hands uh, where we have everyone uh, come in in person. Um, Currently, that's only for people in the UK, but we are starting to think of, you know, do we start to bring over um, people from the other countries that we have working in our team? Um, I mentioned around our tech team having, you know, people in Ukraine uh, and in Georgia, but we also have quite a big team in Nigeria. Um, so uh -huh. having being able to bring everyone together would be really nice. But at the moment, all UK we do once a quarter. Uh-huh. Okay, uh, more questions coming. So Patty is asking the next, what was your biggest struggle with the remote management so far? Oh, good question. Um, I think it's uh, alignment and communication. And I think being, again, really deliberate on doing this, um, because if you think, you know, you just let it happen, things won't fall into place and people won't be aligned. So I think you as a manager, it's really your responsibility to connect those dots and make sure that everyone is on the same page. And, you know, sometimes you have to, as I was mentioning with the slider, sometimes you have to be a little bit overly communicative and overly talk about, um, you know, this is what we decided. Is everyone clear on that? And write that on Slack and write that on, you know, whatever Confluence or Notion or whatever you use um, and make sure that that is passed around. So I think sometimes that over communication um, really helps to to get past that struggle. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. It's maybe like follow up in a bit the previous one, but maybe you will add some new stuff. So Victor is uh, saying, yeah, thank you, super inspiring. Uh, and then how do you as a leader contribute to navigating a team through difficult times, especially with the remote team? Yeah, really good question. And I think we we definitely experienced that through COVID when people's moods got a little bit down um, or, you know, sometimes when we're working on something and it feels like it's a never ending feature. Um, it's like, you know, another ticket and another ticket. So how, how do we do that? So um, I really like to um, sometimes take a break from work. So I find that similarly to how I, you know, how I operate sometimes when I'm trying to get something done and it feels like it's not working, it's not working, it's affecting my mood. I like to kind of step away. I like to do that with the team as well. Um, so doing something completely different. So as I mentioned before, doing a tech talk on something that doesn't have to do it with mm -hmm. work at all, just mm -hmm. something funny. Um, you know, sometimes we do kind of like um, board game nights online virtually. So just all, all playing a game online um, and, it's, it's really important to recognize, um, again, those points of, of low morale and introduce those things. But I think even more importantly is to do that on a consistent basis to avoid that dip in a mood. Um, so to, to kind of nurture that, um, that connection within the team. Yeah. Good. Uh, and that's gonna be the last question for me. That's maybe a bit funny, but I am really interested. So uh, we have like uh, this um, idea going around that developers are very shy and it's difficult to make them talk and be sincere and like be present and everything. And I suppose that, that this can be even more difficult remotely. So maybe you have some hacks and tricks, tips, how you can, you know, make this shy developers being there and like being sincere and active. Hmm. Yeah, great question. 
Um, so I think one thing is as a manager, really getting to know your reports in your one-to-ones um, beyond you know, their professional goals, beyond their everyday work, um, really finding little things about them that you can pick up on. And people, once you start to be interested in them and curious about them, they really start to open up. Um, and I think that that is the, the most important thing is remembering that the person sitting on the other side of the screen is a person um, with their own challenges, with their own things that make them happy, um, with their own you know, family and friends, um, and really understanding that and making sure that you're connecting to that um, is, is the best thing you can do. Nice, thank you. I, I really hope that someone from our audience is actually making notes and will implement that like tomorrow in their team. <laughs> that, that's my hopes. So uh, uh, let's all together say thank you a lot to Yael uh, for being here and sharing your experience and all the tips. And uh, now we are ready to welcome our second speaker. Uh, so uh, please welcome Oleg Vendelenko. He is a co-founder and CEO of Project Timico. And uh, Timico, it's like offline office online. That's the way I call it. I know that Oleg will like explain better and tell what it's actually uh, about but uh, so like have already worked with different businesses who have like this remote type of work and he had like this big overview how other businesses are working and what challenges they have and uh, today he will share with us those stories and uh, he will tell us how in the chemical and there are other businesses how they like solve all the challenges so please welcome Oleg Danilenko. Next 15 minutes are here for you and audience. Please prepare your questions. We really need your questions. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. And I actually realized that we have overlap in the topic, but we also have overlap in the name of the company and uh, even overlap in the background of, of, of the speaker. So <clears throat> I'm Oleg, I'm co-founder and the CEO of Kimiko, as Lisa mentioned. And I have a technical background as well, so software engineering and data science. So uh, very close, <laughs> very close. Um, and uh, Kimiko, uh, we are uh, we're a Swedish startup founded in Sweden, but I am originally from Ukraine, but have been living in Sweden for uh, almost 15 years now. Uh, but we're a Swedish startup of uh, fully remote. We are about 10 people. Uh, here is actually our our office, our virtual office, and our team right now. Uh, it's it's evening, so you can see it. Uh, it's quite empty. But this is basically our product and our team in inside our virtual office. Um, and Timiko, as Lisa mentioned, so we are actually tackling challenges of remote teams. So we are building product for remote teams to be together, and uh, that's why the things I will be talking about they are based not only on uh, my personal experience running a small fully remote team, but it's based on the, all the research we've seen, all the guidelines we've read, and uh, all the customer interviews we've had with our, our customers. So let's uh, jump into it. And uh, I would like to start with the one data point that shows the state of remote in a way. Um, so LinkedIn published last year, post-pandemic uh, statistics where they showed that 53% of job applications went to positions offering remote as an option. Uh, at the same time, there was only 16% of those jobs uh, that were published on the platform, which shows one interesting uh, phenomena that the demand and supply for remote work, there is a huge gap. Uh, there is many more people who want to work remotely than companies who are ready to provide this as an option. And if we look into reasons for that, uh, they go deeply into the fact that during pandemic, everybody realized that personal personal productivity works great for most people, but leaders are worried about group productivity. So, if we when we move to remote settings, we lose some aspect of collaboration. So we don't bump into each other in the corridors. We don't uh, bump into each other near coffee machines. You cannot just turn your head and talk to your colleague. So while individual productivity in remote settings is good. Uh, people basically concerned that innovation might struggle because there was research, uh, a lot of research showing that those kind of serendipity moments, spontaneous communications, they are strongly linked with innovation uh, to the degree where companies actually reshape their offices to have fewer coffee machines located centrally 
on purpose so that people bump into each other. So people worried how do we create these dynamics in, in the remote settings. Uh, loyalty is another question. When you are sitting in your home office with a set of tools, it becomes very easy to change a job. It's same tool, same office. You just kind of change, change employer. Uh, so some companies are worried about being able to build that loyalty. And the visibility and trust, as has been mentioned, is also an issue uh, because there are many leaders, traditional leaders, who are used to judge productivity partially on the hours you spend doing your work. So they see you in the office, they see you're working there late, late, you are great, you're a hard worker. You you leave early, okay, you're probably not a hard worker. It's it's not the right, it's not the right way to judge productivity in the, even in the collocated uh, work. Uh, but when it comes to remote, those leaders really struggle because they're not used to uh, doing things differently. So they need new ways of uh, measuring productivity, which are more uh, real, not based on some uh, some metrics like hours spent doing work. So how do they actually uh, go about solving those problems? Well, I've, I would focus here on three things. First of all is alignment. Uh, second, is empowerment and third is creating an environment for cohesive and for cohesion and innovative innovation within the teams and if you look at those things they actually might seem like very familiar because it's it's not much different from the things you need to succeed in any team if, even if it's collocated team but the way you you get there is is a bit different and what's most important is you need to be much more intentional about it you really need to think about it actively so let's deep dive into how we actually can achieve some of those things. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to alignment, you need to make sure that uh, your team is aligned around values and mission. So you need to talk about your mission early in the onboarding, and you need to talk about it all the time regularly. You need to make sure that people understand why, why we are doing things. And uh, one good uh, one good way I saw many companies doing is uh, where each team has their wiki, has their homepage where they list their team mission and their team objectives. That it it helps team members to always remember why they're doing things, uh, and other team can always look up what's the mission of this team. Um, and then from there, once everybody knows the mission and values and the vision, you need to make sure that everything you do is linked to it. So when you define new opportunities, new bets, new user stories, you need to make it clear how will this contribute to our bigger bigger mission, bigger vision. Um, it's it's really a mindset, so it's there is no specific hack, uh, but maybe you know one thing, is if you have some kind of template for defining new opportunities, you can make sure that you include why into the template and you include how it will be measured into this template. And measuring is important part as well. So you need to make sure that uh, you define very clear objectives that are measurable. Uh, and there, OKRs is one typical way, good way to do it. It's it's it can be quite cum cumbersome to implement OKR full scale, so you can go lightweight OKRs. But important that you have something measurable. Uh, once you align on the mission, uh, another part and part aspect of alignment is make sure that everybody has equal access to information or everybody who needs that access, of course. Uh, so communicate regularly and clearly. Uh, we do, for example, weekly uh, weekly all hands kickoff every Monday. Uh, it's a short meeting, but uh, where everybody is present and we go through uh, happenings from the last week, priorities and focus for this week, uh, for each of the teams. And we look at the uh, our data me metrics, KPIs, and uh, those objectives basically to keep a hand on the pulse where we are on our metrics. Um, you need to make sure that whatever documents you produce, information you produce, that it's stored in some kind of shared resources uh, so that it's always a few clicks away from being shared with, with some new person, etc. cetera. Uh, so forget about storing files locally. Uh, you want them to be in the cloud, in the Google Drive, whatever you use. Um, Document everything. So if there was some good discussion and decision made in the video call, make sure that you follow up with the decision in the shared Slack channel or some whatever tools you use uh, to make sure that everybody in the team knows the decision and uh, briefly what's the motivation behind this decision. Uh, use product project management tools. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, Wiki is a good way to keep 
to keep uh, information centered in central place, uh, you can use Notion or Confluence. There are many tools. Uh, but once you have alignment around goals, you have alignment about in, of inf in information. Um, what you need to do is basically empower your team. And again, this is a huge overlap, of course, with, with the previous topic, but that's a good thing because that is extremely important. That is the number one thing you need to achieve in remote team is to empower people, uh, give autonomy, make sure that you don't micromanage, that when you define tasks, first of all, you involve, you involve people in defining the tasks. It's not like it shouldn't be uh, top down, just a bunch of tickets that people work on. You involve uh, the whole team in the process. You focus on uh, being very clear in communication of what you want to do, but most importantly, why and how it's going to be measured. Because only then people who are to work on this task will be able to come back to you and say, you know, there is, there is maybe a better way to solve the same, same problem and reach the same outcome. So, and you want that. So foster that ownership mindset where people can make decisions and they are uh, not punished for mistakes, but mistakes are turned into learnings. No one, like zero blame, basically. Um, and always focus on outcomes, not output. Meaning that people who do work, they shouldn't think, okay, I need to push those uh, five tasks and then, I, I, I'm, then I'm successful. People need to think, okay, when I achieve this result, this metric, then this, this work is done successfully. So this is very important. Uh, and of course, empowerment is not enough. It doesn't mean just giving them, giving some kind of directions and abandoning the person you need to, uh, or the team, you need to make sure you establish strong feedback loops so that there is a process to constantly follow up on targets, do it regularly. For example, if you use OKR KPIs, look at them daily, weekly, uh, and it, it's, not, it's not enough to just have a dashboard. You, you want to make sure that it's visible. So you like we, for example, every day in the morning, uh, we have snapshot of our dashboard, important, not the whole dashboard, but important metrics shared via Slack channel. Uh, make sure to have regular one-on-ones where you can coach people, correct people's scores if needed, uh, give feedback, uh, receive feedback, etc. And there on the feedback side, it's very important to establish the right feedback culture. There are many guidelines, so I won't go into details here, but basically it's important that people know how to give feedback, how to receive feedback, because it's actually much harder than it seems. And, um, and there are tools, uh, there are tools for uh, doing regular feedback feedbacks. Uh, one I know is Lipsum, uh, but there are there are a few of those. Uh, I, I personally prefer uh, giving feedback in in kind of face to face uh, video settings because then because then there is very little space for misunderstanding of emotions. So, you know, it's it's always hard to understand what did the author put in the specific word. What emotion is it? Anger or is it just trying to help? Um, another tool I, I could recommend is Team Health Check. Uh, there is Spotify Health Check model, uh, but there are also like again there are SaaS tools for kind of employee engagement. Uh, one of them is uh, Winning Temp that I've heard of, but again there is a bunch of those. And what's important besides giving feedback and you know following up following up on metrics, it's establish the culture of celebration, recognition, uh, rewards. Um, there. It's the moment where you can kind of create your own culture around it, depending on you know, how fun or how strict and uh, professional you are. Uh, we do, uh, we have uh, celebrations on the Slack channel where everybody can post maybe some good feedback from customer, uh, some new big contract uh, we land or uh, whatever good happenings, it could be birthday, uh, whatever, whatever uh, happens, uh, positive news, Anybody can share there. Uh, also, we have as part of our product, we have a functionality for sending uh, kudos to your colleagues, and we make it in a bit playful way. So it's we have these hats that you can send to your colleagues, and then uh, everybody in the office would see that you know this, uh, small uh, funny hat on the head of the person. Uh, so th this way, it's, it works very well because then it's recognition and also you know it's soft. You don't need to come up with long, long praising messages. Sometimes it's hard for some people, you know, to really. Uh, be creative with it, but it's it's playful and a fun way to recognize people. Uh, 
So that's that's on the empowerment. So uh, let's say you have you aligned around your goals, you have great team, you empowered, you have feedback loops working. So then when, what you want to do is to create the environment for them to really st- thrive and deliver the best. And there, one of the most important things is that you want autonomy, but you don't want isolation. So you want people to work together as a team. You want people to have communication that's flowing, not not from scheduled meeting to scheduled meeting, from Slack to Slack, uh, but you want always on spontaneous conversations. Uh, there, that's basically what our product is built around. So I, I don't have a better recommendation than to uh, look into basically appropriate tools for that, such as Teamic or uh, or other similar solutions. Uh, but basically, you want people to be available for unblocking, for bouncing off ideas, etc. So it's important to have right communication tools. And then what I find very important is creating, consciously creating space for ideas and brainstorming. So we do lab days, we do product lunches, uh, where we, you know, during lunchtime in relaxed environment, we just tackle some of our product problems together as a whole company, whoever whoever wants to join. So not everybody has to join. And it's a very fun way to actually build this ownership mindset because then people go, outside of their area they just stay they think how 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 we should solve this product problem uh, we have knowledge sharing sessions of course and uh, we uh, have channel and the board for ideas it, this is also i think something i would recommend because it's good to have a space where people can just share their their ideas without polishing them without doing full analysis you know risks etc just got an idea shared it there if it's fun, there will be engagement. If it's maybe not a good idea, maybe there will be no engagement, but it's it's good to have that space. And um, another part where important is, of course, team cohesion. It already was, was covered, but there I just can uh, stress again, uh, be, be intentional about bringing people together, create an environment of mutual support where people know it's okay to ask for help. It's expected to ask for, for help. And where people help proactively when they see someone is struggling, checking up on other people, uh, it's really important. And uh, there again, like create those occasions. Uh, game nights is uh, something we also do. Uh, we also do this. Uh, so we call them know me better lunches, where basically it's it's rotation. Every lunch, one person uh, prepares a small presentation about life story, like from childhood with pictures. You know how basically person grew up. This is was actually extremely extremely fun and uh, nice experience. You learn so much about your colleagues and after that you feel a much deeper connection. Uh, but there are many things and there's many tips also in the internet, but be very intentional about that. And last part uh, on the environment, I would say balance. It's um, it's very hard when you work remotely to feel, uh, sometimes it gets hard to feel when the work day finished and now you're supposed to spend your time with your family. Uh, so be very conscious about that. Kill always online culture. And what's important to understand that it's actually very bad for your team to have this culture. It might feel like, like you you might enjoy that people work work for you, so for your company, so uh, so many hours. But you actually don't want that because you want people to have the right balance, and you need to consciously communicate that it's it's okay to not respond immediately. You need to establish clear communication channels for urgent and incidents, et cetera. And um, make sure that people reflect their availability in the calendar so their colleagues know when, when they are available, when they're not, et cetera. But uh, most importantly, talk, talk to your colleagues because if there is one person who is always online and always responding, then uh, very soon everybody else will feel, feel obliged to do that. And then everybody will be like tired, demotivated, et cetera. So avoid that. Uh, so basically that's that's, that's it for me. So if you have alignment, empowerment, and create environment, uh, uh, create environment for collaboration and innovation, then uh, I think you will be able to succeed with remote work and uh, get the benefits of remote work without losing on the innovation and other things. So that's that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was so inspiring actually and uh, so great that you shared like the real stuff which you were doing in your team like the way you're giving rewards and like having this lunches and like 
breakfast and everything. And uh, when, when you said about the reward, I, I just recall that in Beatwood we have like beat of the months. And uh, that's like we are nominating each other and having this beat of the months and uh, also working well. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat already, and I will read them out loud. Uh, and then I'll ask also my questions. I have two. Uh, the first one is, uh, um, oh, Yulia is asking, how do you encourage continuous learning in your team? It's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's, I think like, the thing is that once you create this environment, uh, like do those things with, I, I mentioned, people sort of want to, want to share their learnings. So once you build a strong connections with uh, psychological safety within the team and uh, give the space for people to speak up. So as I mentioned, so we, to give a specific example, we have this rotation schedule with normally better lunches, but at some point we are aware about 10 people. So at some point we run out of, you know, everybody introduced themselves. So then uh, those sessions turn into people talking about something that excites them. It could be a hobby, it could be a professional topic. So I think there it's important to give, give people the space and build strong relationships, and then people will, will want to share uh, their knowledge, their life, their hobbies, etc. Right. Yeah, it's actually about the culture. Uh, so we have in the chat two actually similar questions. So guys are asking about the tools. Uh, could you please repeat the apps, tools you have mentioned? And if there are other you haven't mentioned from the measuring productivity, virtual offices, etc. So like what tools do you actually use and can recommend to the audience? So uh, for what we use, so obviously we use our own product, Timico, it's a virtual office. Uh, we use uh, Slack for asynchronous communication. I guess everybody knows Slack. Uh, then some tools I named, and some of those I actually haven't used myself, but I know companies that use them. It's a leap sum. It's a tool used for uh, feedback to each other, giving feedback to each other. Uh, as far as I know, I think Spotify is using it. I uh, saw, saw it on their website. So I've, I've heard, I've met people who used it. Um, uh, there is Winning Temp, which is for um, employee engagement tool. Uh, there is uh, Spotify health check model that I mentioned. This one I used a lot and really like Spotify team health check. And it's basically a PDF you can download from Spotify's uh, blog. Uh, but it's it shapes uh, you can you, we normally do it in, in sometimes in retrospectives uh, where you basically let your team to grade how you feel on different aspects like uh, speed of delivery, quality, uh, alignment on the mission, and those kind of things. So I would recommend this the tool. Uh, Notion, I think also also probably everybody knows we use for weekend. Uh, information g drive and google drive and those kind of things so yeah. other than that yeah. it's special good thank you i even i made notes here uh so we have uh, one more question from patty um she says uh thank you for your talk and then can you elaborate on the board for sharing raw ideas how would you introduce it and encourage people to actually use it So what uh, what we do is um, it's a simple board, tra Trello board. We have a few columns uh, like specific ideas and wild ideas and uh, a couple of more spe specific our product product. Um, how we encourage uh, when we, we we do lab days and lab days it's days when you can work on anything you want related to the product. So you can pick any feature you know that is not in anywhere in the roadmap. And when people work on the lab days, they start thinking about those ideas. They go to that board, they see if there's any fun ideas that they want to work on, uh, they create their own ideas. And uh, you know, so, sometimes it can get quite stale. So you need so sometimes it can get quiet in the board. And then sometimes lab day is coming, a few conversations uh, people have, and then there is like 10 different ideas pop up at the same point. So and and then this Trello board is linked to our slack channel so whenever someone adds uh, an idea we have a slack message 
and this way kind of people people are brought and engaged again with the board so that's very specific way how we do it uh, so nice. web base and link it to slack compensation works and inspire others um actually we have to jump to the next speaker so uh thank you a lot Alec, for sharing your experience and answering the questions and uh, i hope people made notes with the list of uh Tools. If you don't make it, you can reach me out to Linux and, and I'll try it because I have already informed that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, our next speaker, uh, let's welcome Chief People Officer from Beetroot, Tanya Bochenko. Uh, she works with the people in tech already for more than 10 years. And uh, uh, today you will hear a lot about like managing people and how like create this environment for teams and how we inspire them to be present and like work together. So welcome, Tanya. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lesia. We we know each other for quite some time, right? And we work in the same company. So thank you for the presentation. And thank you, previous speakers, for sharing your tips because I have already like took taken some with myself. So I will definitely use them in my work. Uh, I will share the presentation and tell you a bit from my experience perspective uh, about the remote work and about the teams. Oh, sorry. You can probably see the wrong screen right now. Sorry for this. Yeah, here it is. And you should see the right one. Right now, we don't see the screen. Oh, something is happening. Yeah, so it said that you had started sharing, but we, we, don't, we don't see it. Hmm. Oh, now you should. Yeah, Why not? eventually. Oh, oh, yeah, Yay. we managed that. So yeah, sorry for that, but still. Uh, and uh, as Lisa mentioned, actually I have some kind of uh, experience from in HR field. Uh, I've been there for 13 plus years and most of them are in IT sphere. So uh, mainly related to technical teams, to product companies to like startups and so on. So I know the environment and uh, I hope that my tips that I'm going to share with you today uh, will be also helpful because they are um, like both from my HR experience perspective as well as from my leadership perspective. So I have different, I have, have obtained different roles during my career as you can see. So I hope that uh, both angles could be helpful for the, for the cooperation with your teams. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm uh, the representative of Bitroot. This is a company uh, we help, uh, this is an IT company, and we help to build uh, the remote teams for our clients, as well as team extensions, and as well as we build a different complex software solutions. So we're 350 people right now, plus something. Uh, and uh, during this period of time, uh, we built 20, 207 teams. So what I'm talking about is actually, I hope that this will prove that I know what I'm talking about because there is so much happened during this period of time and we face so many challenges. And I really hope that uh, like experiences were very successful and good ones. And I hope that today's presentation will bring the best from my experience as well to you guys. So you will know what to do if. Uh, and uh, we were talking about the trusting environment, welcoming environment, and uh, the question that really often arises, is trusting and welcoming environment really needed? Um, please put your input on this, like yes or no, what do you think? Maybe it is overestimated. You can do this in the chat. Um, and I will, of course, just try to take a look at it and like, see if it coincides with my own opinion, but still, I really think that it really matters, like trusting and welcoming uh, environment really matters. And we really need to put more efforts to build in this environment. And I want to share with you one really interesting, but not so pleasant case that happened to be true uh, to us as a company, uh, because you have probably heard about that war in Ukraine right now. And it happened actually at the peak of the war, uh, like we had massive bombing during November, December, 2022. 
and it caused uh, the situation when people lived in the bomb shelters. So they didn't have an access to any kind of offices. Uh, they didn't have an access to stable work environment. They didn't have an access even to like, like things that make their lives and like everyday lives, like everyday things that you have an access to. But at the same time, uh, we had also some long blackouts. We could not have electricity for three, two hours or even more. Uh, we could have some kind of electricity schedules. So people could have electricity for two, three days per week or just uh, two, three hours and then do not have for eight hours, for example. Uh, of course, we had internet breakout, break, breakdowns and uh, people didn't have an access to internet connection for quite long. And um, I have a question here. <laughs> so this is a quite quite a challenge, right? And uh, this could really cause some kind of um, not so active uh, work related environment. I mean, people could not work for a long time, but how uh, much do you think it influenced the results of the team's work we managed that time or our clients managed that time uh, like with Bitru together with our company? And uh, again, if you want to share your, uh, your thoughts, please do this in the chat, but I will share the stats meanwhile with you. And here are the statistics from our, uh, like from our own expertise. And the quantity of non-complete projects during that period of time was zero. Uh, the quantity of deadlines that were not met was about or also zero. And the quantity of projects that we lost because of the war and because of the reasons I've just mentioned was also zero. Uh, this is because people wanted to work more. This is because people wanted to cover all that, to like um, do a bit of extra mile to make this extra step. And they wanted just to, they just understood that they, like influenced the projects much. They understood that they were a big part of the team of the project of the company uh, and they wanted to dedicate all of themselves to, to all that happened actually. And how it happened, you might ask. And this happened because um, of the trust that was built. And trust was mentioned, but by uh, not only by me, but at the same time, I would say that investing the time in building the trust is the best thing you can do for your teams, because this is uh, the first um, time when you meet the person. This is the most crucial part of the work to build the trust, to make this uh, like to 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 build this relationship with your teammates to. Um, make them understand that you really believe in them, that you value their opinion, that you care, that you share, and so on. And please do uh, trust, do show that you do that. Uh, please communicate your plans and goals because you never know when, where, and when your uh, teammates could like bring more of value here. We have very uh, many successful cases when people just knowing the plans could bring aside ideas not related to their like functionality, to their like daily tasks. And uh, these ideas could work like, like brilliantly. And so please, please, yeah, do this. And uh, do not micromanage. Of course, uh, keep a finger on the pulse, just uh, use different tools that help to control the situation in general. But at the same time, please do not just try to, 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 to just follow every step, every single step, yeah? Uh, the second thing is to be in touch with your team. So we have so many tools right now uh, for the online connection, for meetings, so please do not uh, forget to use them. But meanwhile, uh, it is also important to be honest uh, about the results. If they are good and, or bad, please do share them. Uh, ask for the ideas and inputs, even if the team uh, is not ready yet to share them, uh, just like make them do this, like in, encourage them to do this, create this environment when they want to do that. Uh, and be sincere, of course, about, about your own passion, about your ideas, about the state of things, just share. And be open, please. Uh, use every single opportunity for, for 
doing for creating this open environment, uh, like online meetings, all hands calls, uh, share the information, share your strategy and share your passion. And there was a question that I wanted to comment about the LD environment. If you want the, uh, like your team to be driven by learning, by development, by all this stuff, please do this by yourself and share your passion about this because this could really help not even to involve people. They will be involved like uh, automatically into this. And all of this lead to dedication that we all want, of course. And uh, for establishing good relationship, I would say two first weeks since the very start really matter. So please use, or maybe up to one month, but first two weeks of onboarding, of just getting closer, of interacting are really crucial here. Um, so does the remote matter? Does it so much influence the interaction, the collaboration and so on? Um, all teams, from my personal example, like they are remote. And uh, I lead the remote team myself right now. Uh, I worked with uh, remote teams as uh, HR business partner, like with the management uh, from different clients uh, all around the world. And um, to be honest, this doesn't matter. Of course, it is always good to have offline meetings because they bring so much value, they make you closer and so on. But at the same time, we have so many tools right now that could help us to be closer, to make better experience of communication. And um, like you can still use the video conference tools, for example, yes. Uh, the one thing is very, very crucial, I would say, is to switch on the cameras and to have this as a tradition because emotional part is very um, useful. It is very um, needed here because we lose so much uh, in the remote mode and this brings really this good vibe to the conference itself. Um, encourage regu regular check-in. This could be stand-ups, this could be like Friday meetings, this could be casual or in casual things, but at the same time, this is very, uh, very important. So uh, share good and bad. Uh, I, I truly support um, the idea that bad, uh, sharing the bad is really important thing. I do like share it fully. And uh, one more thing is uh, about remote, I would say even myth about remote is that it is impossible to create a kind of uh, informal environment using the remote tools, but it is. And if to uh, turn back um, in our Bitroot experience, we had, for example, uh, such experiences most of the companies worldwide had during the COVID pandemic times. Uh, people started working remotely, people didn't have an access to each other in the office uh, anymore, and they just uh, got bored to work remotely and not seeing their colleagues. So we tried to create a, a time slot in Google Calendar. It's, it could be done in a simple way. So we did this in a simple way where people can randomly join and discuss some topics they are interested in. They could share, for example, what his or her cat is or how they are doing or what are their challenges and so on, depending on who, 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 who else joined. But at the same time, this creates really good vibe. And uh, creating such kind of informal tools, uh, informal, sorry, uh, platforms via different tools, uh, we can use all the benefits from it and we can just minimize the influence of the remote itself. And one more thing, of course, <laughs> I would like to talk from the HR perspective a, a bit because most of the companies, they work remotely, they have some, some kind of HR support, right? We do this as well in Bitroot. And if you do have an access to this, uh, if HR supports your team, please use your HR as a true business partner because HR can still be a very big support to any manager if to uh, collaborate with this person in the right way. Uh, so I would say uh, HR could help really much to understand who in the team is over, overwhelmed and with what. And you could uh, together just sit down and brainstorm around it, what to do, why it happened, how it could be changed and so on. For example, uh, HR could see the whole team in general, of course, if it is a small team for the manager, like some, like five people or seven people, it's obvious for the manager as well. You, you have good contact with the team and you can still control everything, but still, if you have a bigger team, like for example, in the uh, example at the very beginning of our today's meeting, like 50 people, yes, it's, it's harder to track all of them. So HR can be this connector uh, for the even understanding what is wrong with the role, how to use it uh, in more efficient way, what to change, uh, what to do with this. 
uh, if you share the strategy, and I would strongly recommend you to do this with HR business partner, HR can also help you to build the team, to design the team for the future plans. I mean, that will be uh, efficient for the next steps of your business growing, developing. And um, just having an agenda-driven calls, regular calls with the, this person will bring so much value to your cooperation, I promise, because I have such experience, uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, yes, uh, myself, so, yeah. Uh, and as a final summary, I would say that trusting and welcoming working experience is always a key, because it, I cannot overestimate it, and it is really one of the most important things that I would recommend to put your efforts to at the very beginning, especially like I mentioned. And um, remote is overestimated, really. Uh, most of the companies understood this. And I also share the uh, thought that remote uh, brings some challenges, of course, but at the same time, it opens so many opportunities. And not to use this, these opportunities is a crime. Uh, and uh, we have all the available tools that we already can use for uh, minimizing the remote influence together with offline, of course, if possible, but still. And um, it is possible to have an amazing relationship with your team, even remotely. I have a good example here, uh, not one, but I will bring this one, uh, with one of the teams that I manage as an HR business partner. And uh, they had a good tradition, Friday tradition of drinking beer in front of cameras. Like part of the team was in, in Finland, uh, the rest of the team was in Ukraine and uh, in the US, New York, so different time zones, you can imagine they uh, choose appropriate time. I do not recommend you to drink beer, but this is just a beer example, so sorry. And uh, they really, I would say, switched on the cameras. Again, I do not recommend not doing so, but this is the example. And they built so great connections that when they met each other here in Poltava, I'm in Poltava, Ukraine, it's a central part of the country, uh, they, they like gathered together here in the center of Ukraine, uh, the clients came to see their, the part of their managers, the project managers came to see part of their teams and so on. They knew almost everything about each other and they didn't even have this like small talk, not like good vibe. So uh, when you feel uncomfortable, when you feel like not related, when you feel like that you have to say something and you cannot find the right words. So they were so closely connected. And this is a really true uh, cool example I would, I would give here. I think that, yeah, it's all from my side, but maybe Yay. there are some questions. Perfect. Thank you. The beer example is very good. Sounds inspiring. I'm almost ready to go and get a beer, actually. Um, we, we have a couple questions and we're almost out of time. So I will ask them questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the first one is about um, the team size. So how big should be the team? So you have to get an HR for this team. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't matter. It depends on your needs. If you need, uh, I have an experience of uh, supporting the team of two even uh, in the remote mode. It's even, it, it's like more crucial, I would say, because that was an on-site HR next to the developers, but a uh, remote uh, manager of the client. But it depends on how you feel. Uh, if you feel that you do need this support, uh, that you do not um, like keep a track of everything that is happening in your team, that you lose something, that you lose connection, and this happens permanently. Like there is some of kind, uh, like, 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 yes, from time to time. Uh, and you feel that you need this uh, expertise, definitely bring up uh, this mm -hmm. and, and, and have an HR. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh... I'm not sure. I think that you could better like give, give the answer, but like I have to read out loud the question from the audience. Uh, how can you ensure remote team members feel connected and engage, except beer? Uh, that's yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, except beer, what, what can be used? Uh, no, 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 no that's, that's I said. I'm sorry. I was like trying to joke, but it didn't work out. Uh, so how can you ensure remote team members feel connected and engaged? 
Um, I do agree about the communication part, really. Uh, I won't make any new jokes, but still, I do really um, understood during this period of time that communication is a clue. And uh, there is, like, it's very, very, very crucial to create some channels, some tools that will cover those gaps because. Uh, it's easy to come into the office to the team of 10 people and say, hey, uh, I have this news and share or like right away. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we do not have this luxury when we work remotely. So make sure just that you have the good communication with your team. Uh, you cover all the informational gaps you can just to, to, to make everyone involved and you will benefit from this too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, th thank you a lot for sharing your tips and actually we have to wrap up, like we have to finish our webinar, online event, how we can call it, and uh, so I asked our tech writer to bring all people to the screen so our audience can see all the speakers, and uh, I really hope the next event and all of our presentations were useful for the audience and you managed to ask the questions which you wanted. And uh, um, you have the names of our speakers and maybe you can reach them out in LinkedIn if you wanted to ask again about that tool or like how they managed that challenge they had uh, previously. And uh, yeah, so thank you a lot to Muye, Nilag and Tanya for being here, for sharing, for answering and just that, that's really huge support and I, I hope that you encourage our audience to try remote team also and uh, we will spread this format like war and war uh, so yeah uh, we are done with this event I wish all of you great evening and I see you at the next event thank you bye thank you thank you